going on, everybody? What is happening? Hopefully everybody's doing well. Next, welcome to another... Actually, welcome to another <laughs> How It's Made. My name is Ian Robinson. I'm a ZBrush instructor slash trainer at Axon. Hopefully everybody's doing really, really well. Uh, today's going to be a very special stream because... We're going to put a little music on. Because uh, it's not going to be my typical stream like I normally do if you stream with... Uh, if you follow... I'm on every Wednesday from 12 p.m. to 2 Pacific Standard Time. Um, and usually, we, you just kind of watch, you know, skull make something from scratch. And it usually takes a few streams to get something that I like. Well, this time, what we're going to be doing is uh, continuing the How It's Made series. Uh, Paul Gabriel had started a little while ago, and so now some of us at, here at MaxOn are going to go ahead and take some turns making some stuff that you guys can go ahead and follow along with. What is happening, Demon Puke? Yo, what's up, B? That's right, <laughs> Charlie Nash, what's happening? <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. So if some of you were watching uh, or had caught any of the promotion stuff earlier, let me go ahead and load up that video real fast. Um, we're going to be making... Let me just go ahead and turn this on real quick here. So we're going to be making... Where is a good spot? We're going to be making a game top like prop. It's uh, usually used for stuff like D&D &D or any type of uh, tabletop that has little miniatures uh, with it. So we're going to be making something like, in fact, we're going to be making exactly this, except for we might do a little bit of tweaks here and there. So it might be slightly different, but the idea is to make something and for you guys to follow along with me. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be starting from scratch. And the key thing to remember here is that it is completely beginner friendly. So if anybody here is not sure on how to get started in ZBrush or just isn't quite sure how to even make something like that, you'll be able to follow along with me today. It'll be super awesome. So hopefully this is a series that you guys like. If so, please let us know because it's really important for you for the feedback to let us know something that you're interested in. So without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and start the process. I'm gonna kind of walk my, uh, my walk you guys through it. And then also too, I'm gonna to be creating a brush that I use for like wood texture. And then if you guys uh, would like that brush, we'll go ahead and drop it in the description below once this video is up on the VOD. So you guys will be able to get that as well. And then we're also going to be doing an STL drop of the thing I made today. If you guys follow the newsletter, um, that's going to drop on the newsletter. They drop every other week. One dropped last week, so you'll be able to get the STL that I make here today in that newsletter, and you'll be able to print it. So let's do it. What's up, Chris? What's up, B? All right, cool, cool, cool. All here for the miniature creations. Yeah! So we're going to be using simple techniques, and as you can see right here, I'm actually starting from a cylinder. Nothing too fancy, nothing too crazy, um, so it's going to be good. Are you making the well you just had up? Yes, I am making the well I just had up, and we're going to start from scratch. So the first thing you want to remember is that, and this is for all the new newcomers and stuff like that, um, one thing you want to remember is just naming your subtools. It's super important because then you'll be able to kind of identify as you're creating where you are in the, step process, in, in the process of creation. And I like to start with a block out, just something to get an eye of what it is I'm making. I'm not worried about details. I'm not worried about whether or not it's going to be print ready at the very moment. I'm worried about whether or not it's going to look like I want. So let's go ahead and with this one right here, I'm just going to duplicate the subtool by hitting Control Shift D. And I'm going to hide this because we're going to go ahead and save out the gate. And let's go ahead and find a good spot to save this. So let's go here to my local spot and we're going to go ahead to where did I have it? How it's made series, drinking well. So we're gonna go ahead and call this the drinking well prop. And we're gonna go ahead and underscore this as block out. So I like to save all of my iterations as block out and then you know from block out to detailing to final uh, stages like 3D uh, prep. So we're gonna go ahead and block out zero one and that's gonna name the very first asset. Now, like I said, this is a very beginner stream friendly, so I'm going to go through a lot of stuff. And if you have questions, feel free to ask them. Um, and we'll, we're going to go ahead and make sure that this thing gets built. So first step is we have our cylinder here and I just want the block out. I want the shape of the well. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go to geometry. I'm going to go to uh, edge loop 
and then we're going to go to delete loops. Your typical cylinder starts off with all these edge loops and none of them are really necessary. Um, just the ones that are going to hold the shape will be, uh, will be left behind. So delete loops deletes all of the edge loops that don't actually matter to the shape of the design. And the reason why I'm doing this is I want to use Z Modeler to give me the overall shape of what the well looks like. Hey! So we're going to go ahead and hit uh, B for brush, Z for Z Modeler, and M for Z Modeler. And right out the gate, I'm going to go ahead, hover over an edge loop, and it's going to be pre-selected at Insert Single Edge Loop. And we're just going to go ahead and create an edge loop just so that we can basically create our, our wall. So let's get something like that. We don't have to worry too much. And now I'm going to hold Alt. And as I hover over a face, I'm going to go ahead and just drag my cursor around to select all the stuff here. Hey, Red Thing Out Studios, how you doing? Welcome in, welcome in to a How It's Made episode. How you doing? Now we're going to hover over that face because we want to push this in. We want to extrude or Q-mesh this in. So I'm going to go ahead and hold my spacebar, Q-mesh, polygroup all, and we're going to go ahead and start dragging this down. Now, I'm not going to get too, too crazy with the inside. Just push it far enough because this thing is going to be 3D printed. It has to be watertight at the end of this process. So we don't need to punch a hole all the way through. We just need to push it down enough so that when we add in our, quote, water, we'll have it the way we want. And now what we're going to do next is I'm going to go ahead and hold Control and mask the bottom section. And if I hold Alt at the same time, it's going to do a reverse mask selection where now the bottom of the well is, is actually selected, not the top. And I'm going to drag this up just to find my shape because I don't want it to be super tall. Something like that. Not too bad work. Couldn't resist the magic. <laughs> so, nice, man. Well, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you're here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So now we have our base whale shape. And like I said, from here, we're just worried about the block out. So I'm going to go ahead and name this well wall. Let's name them all sorts of fanciness. There we go. And if I go too fast, please make sure to tell me. I can slow down, repeat a process, whichever works for you guys. Now, the next thing I want to do is I want to actually get the get the main uh, the main shape of the actual pillars. So what we're going to do is go to insert. I'm going to add in just a normal cube, something like that. And let's rename this pillars. There, like that. Now, I don't like to work with this cube. If I hit solo, you can see here we have all these points and let's just grab our move brush. I don't like this because of this point right here. I think this point's kind of silly and I just don't like it. So I'm gonna hit W to pull up the gizmo. And if we focus on this cog right here, we can now actually pick a polycube. And once we do, you can see here that this is a much better cube to work with. So it's definitely gonna give us a lot more control over our edge loops and the flow of the actual uh, shape. So I'm gonna go ahead, hit that cog again. And as you can see here, now if I click Gizmo 3D, it's gonna give me this selection. And I'm just gonna stretch this. Let's go back to solo for a second. I'm just gonna scale this down. Oops, scale it up. There we go. I'm just gonna place it on the proper side. Whee! Just like that. Now, if you're following along with me, then just remember that it doesn't really matter um, if yours looks slightly different than mine. All that matters is that you are just blocking this thing out. So we're actually gonna come in here and we're gonna play with a scale. Get something similar to that. Just kind of find our shapes a little bit. Perfect. Now I wanna duplicate this on the other side. So I'm gonna go ahead and if I go to geometry Scroll on up to Modify Topology. We have Mirror and Weld. If our object is on the left-hand side of the viewport, when I hit Mirror and Weld, it's going to, it's going to populate another object on the right-hand side. And now we can kind of see, like, oh, that's probably not... We don't want it that tall. Let's get something like that. Yeah, that's fine. And all of these can be adjusted when, however you like. So if it's... Not quite the way you want it. Let's go in and adjust it. Let's play with it a little bit. 
perfect. And let's go ahead and pull this out just a little bit. Let's hit X for symmetry. And let's get something like this. There we go. Now, let's go ahead and use a really cool feature that I like to fall on the sword with. And that's going to be Gizmo Duplicate. Now, we could do this one of two ways. Actually, you know what? Before we do that, let's actually... Let's not do Gizmo... Let's not do Gizmo Duplicate. Let's actually just duplicate it straight on. So this will be Side Pillars. Let's rename this as Side Pillars. Don't mind the sporadic decision change. If we hit Control shift d we'll duplicate it. And now we'll call this our Top Pillar. Just because this will make more sense. We'll solo this out. And we're just going to go ahead and hold Control shift select one side, and then go to Geometry, Delete Hidden. Geometry, Modify Topology and delete hidden. And now I'm gonna center this back to the world orientation because it's off over on the side, I don't need it to be. So if I hit that home button, that's gonna recenter it. Now I can go ahead and pivot this 90 degrees. And if you rotate and hold shift, it actually snaps every five degrees, which is what we want. So we're gonna say 90, perfect. And now let's actually play with the shape of this one. And let's scale this out. Now this is where we get to kind of find the rest of the shape of the wall pillar. I want this to be a decent size because we're going to be printing it. So we can't go too small. If we go too small, then that's actually going to cause some conflict in the print itself because we'll lose a lot of details. For those of you who don't know or don't have a lot of 3D print experience, when you 3D print something in red, there's going to be about a... 10 to 15 percent detail loss. It's just inevitable. Depending on how 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 great of a resolution your printer is, you might be able to preserve a good majority of it. But there's always going to be some detail lost. So in this process, not only are we worried about how the details will look at the end, but the size of the object will matter in capturing that detail. So we're actually going to make this a little bit thicker than we normally would. Let's select this one by holding Alt and tapping. And we're actually going to scale this up a little bit. And we're going to push this in because we're going to want these to intersect just a little bit. And as you can see right here, we're already starting to get some sort of shape that will help us out. Now, I feel like it's a little too thin, but that's okay. We'll worry about that in a minute because we're going to be making bricks. My audio is dropping out a little bit. You may need to plug in your headphones. Interesting. Let me let me try something on my side and see if that's it. One second. intermediate intermediate how about now does that sound better not sure if that's gonna help it or not I was running it through a little bit of that uh, I was running it through um, my graphics card block that noise out it's fine at the moment I'll let you know if it drops again okay perfect all right let's go ahead and leave it like that I just have the AC going on in the background. So if you guys can hear the AC, let me know. It does get a little hot, but we'll leave it like that and let's see what happens. Perfect. Thank you for the update. I appreciate it. Okay. Can't hear the AC? Awesome. That's good. I could see the flickering of it. It's so low, but <laughs> all right. Does anybody have any questions right now? Is if ever if anybody has questions, please feel free to answer. Again, this is uh, this is more of a how it's made, so we're going through the whole process so that anybody can follow this at the end of it. Great. So right now we have our basic shape, but we need to we need to worry about kind of looking stuff up. Now, if you're if you're wondering the design or the elements of stuff, a lot of times we're gonna we're gonna talk about reference for a second. Reference is key. 
And anytime you're making something for the first time, even if you're following along with somebody like this tutorial, it's helpful to still look at references. So what I like to do is I just go to Google and I type in drinking well, and I go to images, and we take a look at wells that I'm interested in, something that makes sense. And if we click on one, we'll end up finding a slew of stuff. Like this thing right here looks pretty cool. So, and of course we're building something very simplistic where I have something that's like this, but I don't even have the top portion. So, we'll, this, this is a really good way to get ideas of making stuff. So if you're ever curious on, on design elements, just pull from the real world. You'd be surprised what you can find. So usually I dock my references off on the side and I leave them there for now. Now let's go ahead and refine this shape just a little bit. So I'm actually gonna squeeze this down like such. And now we're gonna actually come on through and we're going to have this come to a point, okay? So I'm actually going to pivot this up. So let's solo for a second. And let's go BZM for Z modeler. With symmetry turned on, I'm actually going to hold Alt and delete that edge loop by hovering over the edge loop and deleting that. And now we're going to hold Control and mask the center section and invert that. Holding Alt. And now we're going to drag this up a little bit. I just want a little bit of variation to it. I don't want anything super crazy. Just something like that will be fine. Great. Now let's go ahead and finish the block out itself. So I actually would like to have a pole go through the middle of the pillars and then to have a little crank on the side there. And this feels a little condensed. So I'm actually going to scale this down just a little bit. There we go. Now let's go ahead and uh, save because <laughs> I love to save. I recommend saving. We, haven't ch we have only done a bit of the block out, so we don't need to worry about too much there. Now if we go to insert, now we're gonna add in a new cylinder. And we're gonna do that same thing we did before where I'm gonna scale this down. We're gonna go to geometry. We're gonna go to edge loop and delete edge loops. Again, this just gets rid of all of those loops that are unnecessary to the initial shape. We'll scale this down, rotate this at 90 degree angles and we're gonna punch this through just like that and we'll stick that there now we don't want this too too small when you're 3d printing stuff or having stuff built for 3d printing you'll actually be surprised on how big things are gonna feel so we're gonna have something like that You could make the holes and the rod and make it a uh, functional well. Yeah, you, you really could, absolutely. But having functional shapes will give you a hard time when 3D printing. If I punch a hole through it, it might be kind of cool, but we can fake the hole. And that's, that's actually one step I did take. So I'll show you how to fake the hole so it looks functional. We'll get there. You'll, you'll, you'll like it. <laughs> okay, so now we have something like this that's there, it's perfect. We're not really worried too, too much. In fact, we're gonna go ahead and just have it kind of peek out just a bit. Now I'm gonna want the crank itself. And the way I designed the crank was really simple. I actually used gizmo and masking, but there's a few ways we can cover that. So let's come here and we're gonna rename this. Again, naming conventions are huge. So I'm gonna name this and this will be, we'll just call this my center, my center bar. I'm very creative, I know. Center bar, boop. <laughs> now I'm gonna go ahead and that trick I mentioned earlier, the control drag. So if you bring the gizmo up by hitting W and hit control and drag, you can drag out a second shape. And that's what we're gonna make our crank out of. Now I will go ahead and separate this. I'm that, I'm that type of guy that likes to just separate. So boop, we're gonna do that. I keep a lot of my subtools separated, but that's just another way that we can actually get the shape that we want. And now let's squeeze this in and let's let's figure out how to make the crank. And we could do it a few ways. Crankshaft, absolutely. And now this will be the crank. Boop. Crank handle and then crankshaft. 
Let's get technical. Let's get technical. Crank. So for you, Rithion. Shaft. Boop. There you go, buddy. All right. Now, let's go ahead and scale this down just a little bit. Because the handle is going to be smaller than... Well, it could be smaller around the same size. We don't want it too much smaller. We're going to add a little bit of, like... We're going to add, like, a little bit of a of a little cap that's going to make it look functional. Now, let's hit BZM to go back to Z Modeler. We're going to hover over an edge. And now we're going to go from insert single edge loop to multiple edge loops. And I'm going to say keep polygroup. It's defaulted on alternate polygroup, which is really good if you're wanting to count steps and you're needing to have an even number. Because as you can see here, if I draw the first one out, it actually changes from green, yellow, green. And if I do it again, it's now green, yellow, yellow, green. If I do it, so I can distinguish between an odd amount of polygroups or an even amount of polygroups, which is really, really helpful. But in this case, that doesn't really pertain to me. I'm not really trying to be super specific. So I just want to draw out a couple. So that's how I'm going to do that. And now we're going to go ahead. I'm going to show you the masking method on how to just manipulate something. And then I'm going to show you another method with like a uh, uh, deform soft or just a bend arc. So there are a few ways to do this. For this one, to just get really simple and you're just wanting to move something, if you just mask off a section, invert that, and then hover your gizmo by holding Alt and move it over an edge loop, you'll actually bend on that edge loop. So you can come here and bend, and then you can reposition it and scale it up and down. That is one way to do it. And I've seen a lot of people do this where it's really effective, and you can even kind of stretch it out just a bit so you get a nice, you just get a nice transition between one point and another, like this. And then you just repeat this process again. Come on down here, come here. You can hold shift to get a proper angle if you would like. You can even go really, really advanced, say 90, and we could drag this out. So you could do something like this. This is like super, super beginner. Another way that you could do it is actually a little bit more advanced than that. So if we hold W and center this to the center, and then let's go ahead and we're gonna go with a bend curve. Now a bend curve, what it does is it gives you two points of contact, and then you have some uh, you have some adjustment sliders here, or cones, we'll call them. So you have a curve resolution, a smoothness, you have an axis you can work off of, symmetrical, yes or no, smooth, all sorts. So what we're gonna do is this yellow curve resolution, if we drag this out, you can see we actually get more points. Let's zoom in a little bit more. So you're gonna get more points here. And the more points you have, the more you can fine tune that curve. For right now, we're just gonna have a couple and then if I, ho if I hover over one of those points, I could start to bend this. Come over here, actually insert that right there. And at any point in time, you can come up and you can add more resolution. Like such. And you just fine tune this however you would like. Add a couple more. So if you're re if you're new in ZBrush or you've never played with this, I definitely recommend checking this out. It's really, really helpful to get the shapes that you're looking for. Now, you might notice too that my resolution is dependent on how it moves and how it flows. So if you are struggling here, it is control Z uh, functional. So you can actually stop this method here. Hit Q again. Let's add a few more edge loops. So we'll add one here, here. If I hit W again, you can see now by adding those edge loops that actually cancels that action. So you do want to be careful, but I point that out because again, when doing uh, any type of deformer method that if you're not getting the results that you want, that you can just back up at any point in time. 
and correct those changes. So that's what we're going to do here. We're actually going to back it just a little bit more and add just a couple more edge loops before we bend it. So let's put this back here where we want. And now let's go back, bend curve. And you can see here, it did remember my adjustments. So it ha had actually about resolution of five or six, which is great. But we're going to go back here and we're going to adjust again. So don't be afraid to play and take a look at what it is that's happening. It's You're just kind of trying to find the shape that you want. And it'll be really, really helpful to come in here and just play around. So very functional, very useful. And now you can see it is actually giving me a little bit of an easier time. Do the points snap to the axis with shift? Yes, it does. Absolutely. Great question. So if I am holding shift, it will actually kind of snap to a little bit. Actually, you can see these numbers here. It's kind of might be hard to see. It's like 0.6. So it actually does kind of snap. It doesn't snap exactly like the five degrees, but it will snap to a certain point. So holding shift does give you snapping ability. Let's actually increase that resolution just a little bit more. It's like a slider, so you're just gonna grab and slide. Whee! Now if I hit D on the keyboard, it will give me a dynamic viewport. So I can actually see how this looks in dynamic mode. Let's put that straight in. If we hold shift, we can just pull that straight across. There we go. There, like that. And now we have something like that. We're actually going to let go of dynamic. Yeah. Let's go ahead and add that there. And I'm just going to play with this a little bit. Let's go ahead and hit W. And so we now have something like this. Again, we can fine tune this however we would like. What I'm going to do is I'm actually, I just wanted the shape, so now I can hit accept. And what I can do from here is actually refine this with masking and adjusting. Beep. Mask this section here. There we go. And we'll come back and we'll correct the shape the rest of the way once we have the rest of the model blocked out. Now, what I would like to do actually is do see if we want to see it in dynamic smooth, what we can do is come on down to polygroups and we can go to group by normals. So then we actually get every, uh, was it 45 degree angle change? We'll get a new polygroup for that normal. And then we can go to crease our, we can actually crease our polygroups by going to geometry and go to crease, crease polygroups. Now, if we hit D, we can actually get something that's a little bit more a little bit more smooth and we can fine tune it the rest of the way now if anybody is curious and i know we've actually gotten this question before with uh ask zebra so i would like to actually kind of point it out now but these yellow poles right here that come out these yellow poles are actually showcasing the normals of our mesh and because dynamic subdivision isn't real geometry, I can actually grab those points. Those are the points where they are in real time. If I were to go ahead and hit Shift D to turn that off, you can see that there's a point right here. If I hit D, you can still see that point exists. So these poles are actually pointing to the real geometry and where that lies. So if I wanted to move this, I have to grab those poles, but that's only in dynamic subdivision. If I were to go to dynamic subdivision under geometry dynamic and hit apply, watch what happens with those poles. They disappear. And that's because now that's actually in real time. That's the real points of that normal. So it's just something to note. If you see this little pole sticking out on your mesh, it is an indication that you're using dynamic subdivision and that geometry is not real. So just something to keep in mind. I'm actually gonna highlight this spot right here real quick. And we're gonna kind of rotate this. 
gives us something a little bit more. Whee! Let's go ahead and grab that. Let's actually scale this handle part down just a little bit. Give us a little bit of a cleaner, cleaner look. Okay, now we're not going to want to focus on that all day long. We have a base shape that we can work with and we can adjust it the rest of the way. Let's go ahead and save. Now I'm going to want to make the bricks, the water, the buckets, and the rope. Assuming we want a bucket. I think we want a bucket. Let me actually squeeze this in a little bit here. I'm going to make this smaller real fast, so I'm going to hover over local symmetry, which if you don't have local symmetry turned on, even though you're working in symmetry, uh, when you go to scale, notice that it kind of scales off center. It's not staying center with the model. So if I hit local sim and then start to scale down a little bit, it actually now stays center to the subtool. So just something to keep in mind when doing it like that. All right. Now let's actually go ahead. Let's first make the bricks and then we'll make the water that goes with inside. So to make the bricks, we're actually going to go below the crank handle and I'm just going to insert again, a new 3d cube. And as you might see, especially if you're new to ZBrush, a lot of the workflow can be very repetitive. So really simple breakdown to get the shape we want. Just start with a new sub tool and then redefine. And again, I don't like this, this original shape, just like we were saying. So if we hit that cog and then we go to poly cube, gives us something like that, hit that cube again. And now we can work with just this cube here. We're going to make the brick shape. Now that's a really small brick for 3D printing. So we're actually going to make that a little bit bigger. Scale that up. Now we're going to be using array mesh. And array mesh is a really good tool to duplicating a subtool multiple times in a radial axis. And you can actually offset it and pivot. We can do all sorts with it. But today we're going to keep it very simplistic because again, we're trying to make sure that we just have a nice simple workflow that anybody can, can start up. And especially if you're new to array mesh, um, this, this sometimes can be a little intimidating. So we want to keep it as simple as possible. So we're going to go to array mesh and we're going to turn that on. And now we're going to set up transpose and lock position. Once we have these buttons here, we now can actually start to populate this brick the way we want. So I'm going to go ahead and actually first, before we do that, let's center it home and let's actually solo this out so you can see it in its just by itself a little bit more clearly. Transpose lock position. And now what we're going to do is we're going to repeat these bricks a few times. So for right now, let's start with something like eight, a nice even number. And right down here, see if you could see this correctly. We have a few options that we want to focus on. Offset and scale, rotate and pivot. This is in which you can actually kind of populate and deform your, your mesh the way you would like it to be. We're just going to focus on rotating right now because all we need to do is create essentially a circle of bricks. So if we focus on rotate and then we go down to the Z axis, you can see there, I just clicked that, and because it kind of slid it, it's now starting to rotate around. If we hit 360 degrees, it's now going to give us kind of a circle of bricks. If I take one of these arrows and start to move this out, you can see here we're now creating. Let's actually change a different material to basic material. Using the gizmo, we can actually now have a set of bricks that we can use to set up. And if we turn solo right there, you could see here that was solo. Sorry, let's turn that off. And we're actually going to change this axis. Let's actually go back here. Zero. We're actually going to use the Y axis. Troubleshooting on the fly. Y axis is what we're going to be working on. Apologies for that. And now you can see we can start to populate this 
alongside. Now we may not have enough bricks, so we're actually gonna increase the amount of bricks. So if we go to repeat, and let's say 10, what does 10 look like? 10's looking okay. What does 12 look like? Not 102, Ian, 12. Yeah, that might be a little bit better. Now it's okay that the edges are touching because again, we need to make this water tight. So we can do something like that and see how that looks. I'm more just kind of critiquing myself as we go through it, bring this in. Something like such. Let's look at this again. Now, if you would like to adjust the brick itself, like if you're not super happy with these corners touching, we can actually just go ahead, mask the section off. We can actually pivot this around so our bricks look a little bit more like that. And because we're manipulating the one brick, we now have all control of the other brick. So now all of that is actually manipulating completely around the table. So this is where array mesh really comes in super strong because we could just kind of manipulate that as we see fit. There we go. Now I actually don't want these touching because what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna create the brick texture by filling it in uh, on the inside and give the illusion that there's actually like, I think, I think it's called mortar where it's like the, you know, the glue that holds the bricks together. So we're gonna have this here Let's recenter this, turn off symmetry, scale that down, have something like that. It's a Stargate. <laughs> it really is, right? It really is a Stargate. All right. Now we're gonna keep this really, really fun and really, really simple. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna detail this brick just a little bit. We're gonna have a little bit of fun with this. So. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to, with just one of my shortcuts, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go to poly groups. I'm gonna go to group by normals. I'm then gonna go to, go to geometry, crease, crease, crease poly groups. And now I'm gonna subdivide this up just a little bit. Just, just a teeny little bit. And now I'm just gonna give it just a, just a little bit of, of detail, nothing too crazy. Kind of smooth some of this out just a little bit. Make them look a little bit more like bricks. This is the only time where if I want something to look a certain way, I do a quick little detail pass. Pardon me. Um, a quick little detail pass to just let my eye see what it is I need them to be. Sometimes it's helpful for me to do that. So I'm not getting into full details. I'm just kind of relaxing the geometry a little bit, rounding them off, giving them something that tells me, hey, these are bricks, nothing more. Great, so a little bit of smoothing. Perfect, so if we turn that off, they look a little bit more brickish and we'll get to more final details later. Wonderful, all right, now what we're gonna do is I'm liking the way this is. This has nice spacing to it. You can even shrink that in just a little bit more because again, we got a 3D print this, so this will be pretty good like that. So now once we're satisfied with array mesh, we can go ahead and say make mesh down here at the bottom. By doing this, it's actually going to make this one brick. Now all these bricks will become geometry. So it's gonna take the one brick and it's going to say, yep, all these other ones that you're mimicking are now officially that, uh, they're officially mesh as well. So hit a make mesh and it will do, oh, I have subdivisions on. Let's go ahead and lower our subdivisions. It will not let you do it with subdivisions. Go ahead and make mesh and now we have something like that. So once again, let's actually back that up. So I had subdivisions turned on because I added a little bit of detail. If you go to array mesh and say make mesh, it will give you a little warning. Hey, freeze your subdivision levels or get rid of them. I'm gonna go ahead and delete them because I'm gonna show you a really cool trick. So array mesh, make mesh. Now, if you want the subdivisions back, just go to geometry, reconstruct. 
and it's going to reconstruct those subdivisions. I don't like to use free subdivision levels because I feel like um, if you don't unfreeze them, it could cause you to, uh, it might cause a little bit of issue with trying to retain, trying to bring those subdivisions back. So we'll go ahead and just delete higher, make mesh, and reconstruct. How big will the final print version be? So the typical sizing as I understand it, so if, anybody's <laughs> if anybody else is here who knows better than I, but the typical sizing will be about 30 millimeter, which is um, 25 to 30 mil millimeter is about a typical size depending on the props that you have. So we're gonna keep it within that range of about 30 millimeter. 25 to 38, perfect. Thank you, sir. The one I showcase, which actually I have a little preview print right here. If you guys would like to see it. And I did this at 30 millimeter. Now it will be scale friendly. Do I have a big screen of me? I do not have a big screen of me. Let me add that real fast. Scene two, let me add in my camera. Say yep. See if it'll let me do it on the fly. No, of course not. You're not gonna let me do that. Let's go back to mainstream. Let's go to this camera. Let's copy this. Let's go here. Let's right click paste. This might. Okay, this is this is a random little thing. I don't know if you can see that, but this is about 30 millimeter ish. Kind of small. It might be a little hard to see, but it is printable. Here is so about that size that was really bizarre let's not do that again <laughs> so if you would like it bigger if you would like it to be like 38 go ahead and you can scale it up we will set the size at 30 the nice in between now that we have our bricks here let's go ahead and lay this on the surface like that now we're just going to use the gizmo duplicate trick it really is a miniature 11. <laughs> nice, yeah. Now we're just going to use the gizmo duplicate trick. So we're going to bring up the gizmo by hitting W, holding control, and we're going to drag this up. And again, you can't have subdivisions when you do that. So we're going to drag this up, get our nice little spacing like such. And we're going to make sure that's to the center because if it wasn't before, when we rotate, it's going to give us an issue. So hold Alt and tap this little uh, icon, little world icon. And now we're gonna rotate this off center like that. And you could be as precise as you would like to be, but now I'm gonna go ahead and duplicate this again. And because we're making a miniature, we don't need a whole lot of bricks. So we're gonna leave them, that looks pretty good. Let's scale this down to the bottom. And now let's just scale this up, even stretch it a little bit, make it fit our block out. And a trick I like to do when making a miniature is actually on your screen, drop it down super small. So we have our block out here, right? Let's just control stamp, uh, shift stamp that. Zoom this out. If you can't see the detail from here, then more than likely it's not going to print well. It's just a little thing I've picked up over time. So if you make it pretty small and you can still read the object, then you're pretty, you're pretty close to having something that will print well. That doesn't mean it's for sure. It's just something that I do. I'm like, yeah, I can actually still see the brick layout. So when I print this, as long as I make sure that there's enough uh, carving in and space in between those bricks when I actually make the print, it should help me uh, make sure that it's printable. So just a little tip, something I do to kind of let my brain know and let my eye know that it is happening. Definitely a resin print job for sure, yes. Most miniatures, I believe, are printed out of resin, at least the ones I've seen. So if you are planning on printing this miniature, go ahead and you would definitely want to use a resin printer. Although I've seen some really cool stuff done with FDM printers. So um, if you're a specialist in miniatures on FDM, that is awesome because that definitely is a very fine-tuned machine. Exaggeration is key for making miniatures, absolutely. So now this is where we're going to really utilize our, um, our ability to have our block out benefit us. 
So not only is the block out there to help us make sure that the um, that we're we're following our design, the other thing that it's doing is that we can reuse some of the assets to fill in and make sure that our mesh is colliding with another mesh to make it watertight. So with this piece right here, for example, I can actually expand this up and have this collide with my bricks. So now my bricks will be colliding with here. So when we actually make this, um, when we make this watertight, this is actually going to help us a lot. So that is definitely something to do. Now I'm going to take my bricks here and let's actually make them a little bit bigger. Actually, let's save real fast. Save, save, save. Yeah, that's what I use FDM for as well. Like making, like making, uh, large large prints with that okay any questions so far and hydrate yes sir i will do that any questions so far um again this this the this video or this stream in particular is uh actually to make sure that it's it's very uh simple but introduction to using some nice tools within zbrush to to start making stuff okay Feel free to ask them as we come through. Now we're gonna go ahead and actually make these bricks just a little bit longer. May not be there yet, but how do you do the wood grain? Oh, you're gonna love it. You're gonna love it because the wood grain brush I made it actually can duplicate as a skin brush. No joke, <laughs> being serious. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna go ahead and, and, and get that get that going going good you'll you'll like that <laughs> yeah it was total accident by the way but uh colleague at work pointed that out. he's like yeah i can use this as a skin brush and i was like that's actually it's not a bad it's not a bad idea okay let's actually get this uh get this filled in a little bit more so we're gonna sew this out i want to push this i want to actually kind of push this in a little bit so to do to do this right here <laughs> I'm actually going to hover over a face, and right now I have Q Mesh all polygroup selected. If I start to drag this out, it's going to make a new edge loop. But if I hold Shift, you can see here that I'm actually able to keep that one edge loop and just push it back. This is the power of Q Mesh. This is what I really like about Q Mesh. So I'm actually going to push that back just a little bit, not too much, which will start to showcase a little bit of the bricks. Now, if I do myself a favor and do po uh, crease polygroups, and then I go ahead and hit D, we can smooth that out. Although I need to, let's actually go to polygroups, group by normals, and then we'll crease our polygroups. So geometry, crease, crease polygroups, and now get something like that. And what we could do is kind of fine tune this to fit what we would like. Now. I would like to fine tune this not one at a time like this, that's gonna take forever. So a really cool tool is actually going to be using radial symmetry. So if I activate symmetry, you can see here that I have my X and my Z. Let's close this for a second. You can see I have two points, X and uh, on both the right and the left. And if I come up here to transform, I have X, Y, and Z. So I actually can turn on, let's say Z and radial symmetry. And now I can actually have multiple points. And actually, let's do Y. There we go. This Y is up and down, so we're going to pick Y. Now you can see multiple points. So here, I now can, at the same time, move multiple points together and kind of push that in just a little bit so that it collides with the mesh the way I would like that to be, just like such. Now we're going to fill up most of this with water, so I'm not too worried about seeing these bottom ones because we're going to put a new sphere in here for water but for these top ones that's going to make the most sense so we're going to go ahead and kind of push that in just a little bit well 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 look who is there <laughs> how are you doing welcome in welcome in sounds like i'm gonna love it heck yeah all right 
So that is radial symmetry. Now what we're going to do is let's actually create the water. So here real fast, we have our bricks. Talked about it before. We're going to do naming conventions. So now we have our bricks. So let's come here and type in bricks Boop. or brick. I can't name. I can't spell. I can't do it all. That's my name right there. Absolutely. How are you doing? It has been a long time. Great to see you. Thanks for stopping by. How are you doing? <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and let's do, boop, 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 boop. let's get the water. So we're going to go ahead and insert a new cylinder. We're just repeating stuff. I'm actually going to scale this down and make this fit. So let's turn on transparency. And now you can see that we have our water here. Now I'm having these pillars on the inside. So we're actually going to want to space these out. It's feeling a little cramped right now. So we'll space out those pillars in a second. But before we do that, let's grab our water. Let's re rename this water. Boop. And we'll take our Z modeler brush, so B, Z, M hover over an edge and now we're going to go multiple edge loops and we're just going to go ahead and give us some edge loops. This is going to help us capture detail when we start actually adding some ripples and stuff by hand. And we're not even going to go too crazy on the ripples. So the more edge loops you have, the more detail you'll be able to capture. So at the top here, you'll see I have active points. If we control Z, you'll notice I have active points of 482. Well, I want a lot of detail, but I don't need a lot of subdivisions. So with adding more resolution, I could just really blast this up to now adding, whoop, touch that right there. So now I have 2,658. But what this will do is let me capture more detail. Let me show you. So if we go here to turn off our frame, Shift W, and let's just add in a standard brush. If I start to try to add detail, there's no edge loops here, right? It's just not doing anything. It literally is not doing anything. So if I add a few edge loops, let's say like that, and now I turn that off and I start, you can see I got some good detail here. Now I'm still at subdivision level nothing. We're on the very first subdivision level. But if I come back here, go back to my Z modeler, so B, Z, M, and I add in a ton. So now let's add in about 2,000 worth of edge loops and now turn that off, go back to my standard brush. You notice here how the resolution looks a lot better than it did with like 200. So it's a really good way. If you have a lot of edge loops here, you can capture a lot of detail. So when we do finally subdivide, say just subdivision level two, Look how clean that's starting to get subdivision level three. And we're only at 45,000 points. And we didn't add any more than a couple subdivision levels. We're at subdivision level three. So when you're using uh, Z modeler and you have something like this that doesn't have a lot of edge loop support, you get that opportunity to add in a lot of edge loops and keep your subdivision down, keep your poly level down, but still able to add detail. Uh, the keyboard pop-up screen is actually, if you go to Google and just type in OBS keyboard imp, uh, keyboard overlay, you'll actually get taken to, it's a free thing, and you could just uh, install it. Uh, let's see here. Just th had a thought of using hot glue gun to make water after it's been printed. <laughs> nice. Would that melt the plastic? Yeah, so... Um, it depends. It wouldn't really melt resin so much, but I agree with what Retheon Studio said here. Yeah, if you use like a clear UV um, resin that you could probably pick up in any uh, like Michaels or Amazon, um, it'll be a lot better. It'll look a little bit cleaner too. And then when you paint it, if you use um, like a glaze medium uh, uh, mixture with paint, you can get a really nice kind of clear um, and and kind of glossy look, make it look more waterish. 
Um, I do read comments, absolutely. Um, so I actually I'm going through uh, something called Restream. So I'm getting I'm getting both you I'm getting YouTube, Twitch, and uh, Facebook as well. So yeah, we stream to three platforms at the same time. So I see you on Twitch and I see you on YouTube. Not a problem. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do here. Let's go ahead and grab our Z modeler. Whoop. And add in just a bunch of edge loops. I'm not even gonna care. Boom, 2,000. 2,000 edge loops. Woo woo. I'll do that at the bottom too. Why not? Just to have them. It only makes it at 4,000. It's really nothing. But that's gonna be perfect for what I need it to be. And now we're just going to use transparency. Transparency is gonna be my best friend, by the way, when it comes to making things watertight. Because again, in order for it to be watertight, when we go to DynaMesh this together, we want the subtools to be intersecting with each other. If they are floating next to each other and they're really small, what's gonna happen is when they weld together, it might break. And then you'll have little pockets, little holes, and sometimes the top and the bottom will weld together and they won't weld correctly. And then you'll have internal little bubbles and it'll say it's not watertight. So for something like this, if I just hit D for dynamic, it's gonna kind of smooth it out a bit. I can scale this up and make sure that it is intersecting into the rest of my model. But when we turn off transparency, we can't really see that too much. The sculpting details will help us the rest of the way. And actually let's do 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 do. Kind of make that like such. I'm gonna be adding a little bit of dirt at the bottom. So I can we can create a little bit of a base or we can create a simplistic base with a little bit of dirt. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll play around with that. Let's actually, let's put this down at the bottom here like such, right? And then I'm gonna lower the water level, Wait, like that. There we go. Now, same thing goes for our well wall internal right here. If we wanted a little bit more resolution, let's go ahead and grab the Z modeler and let's add in a little bit more on the sides so that we can actually detail that up later. And let's actually increase all and increase just the poly groups again. So now if we see anything we want to adjust, again, we can kind of push that in, create that detail. And we'll add a little bit of noise and stuff to make that look like it's a bit of imperfection, but we don't need to go crazy. A part of me really wants to go nuts and really detail this beyond what it needs to be. You're gonna get that itch. So try not to, <laughs> try not to go too, too overboard, but you are definitely wanting, I'm wanting to go more, go more. Let's scale this out a little bit here. Let's move our crank back out this way just a little bit. Let's move this here. Boop. Just like that. Okay, there we go. That looks a little bit more fitting. Now, if we want to move multiple objects at the same time, let's say this whole thing to me is too low. This is too crushed. I want it a little bit taller. What we're going to do is actually turn on this little pizza box thing right here. Boop. And I'm going to select just this top part by holding shift control and dragging that out. And now I can just move all of these sub tools together at the same time and it grays out the rest of the stuff. So I can actually see like, yeah, I want it more like that. Perfect. There we go. That's looking a lot better, a little bit more spacious. Let's go ahead and save. Now, mind you, we're still on block out. So I can either make a new version, 01, so I can make it 02, or I can keep it the same, but I like to have steps. Uh, can you read the... Oh, you can add, I'm sorry, I can't read. Uh, you can add blue ink to resin UV that would apply as well. Oh, that's a great tip, very nice. Can what be wrapped around a sphere? And I'm not sure we're seeing the restream YouTube comments. You might be correct. Let me try something. Let me restart this one sec. Let me not the stream. Let me just refresh the restream. Okay. 
I think you might be right. Let me head over to YouTube. Let me click on here. I got myself muted. Okay. For some reason, yeah, that's not popping out. Let me pop this chat out and let me put them side by side because I am, we are streaming to YouTube, but for some reason it's not letting me do it. Of course, we had some spammers. That's always nice. Geometry is the why. <laughs> okay, I am now reading YouTube comments. Uh, you can see right here. Okay. Um, Let me go through some of these. Sorry if I missed them. How do you get the keyboard up on the screen? Okay, we answered that. Uh, just wondering, why did you make polygroups on the bricks? So great question, George. Uh, I made polygroups on the bricks so that, let's take a look at them real quick. So I made the polygroups on the bricks so that I can actually add a little bit of a creasing so that when I subdivided, I didn't get collision happening I didn't get them rounding too much. So with the poly groups, I was actually able to then go to geometry and then I went to crease and crease by poly groups. And that way I only had to go up barely a subdivision level or two to get what I wanted. So you can see here we had this actually at a very low resolution. So that is why. No plastic. Uh, so I can see your YouTube comments now. So I do apologize for not being able to see that. Restream was not feeding it to me like I thought it was. Yes, Ellie, thank you so much. Yep, much appreciated. Moving a large bowling object up and down is a good way to check for internal pockets that need to be filled. Absolutely. Okay, great. All right. Um, if somebody doesn't mind, just do me a favor and actually test com or just comment again on YouTube just so I could see if it's popping up in real time that would be awesome because I don't want to leave any questions behind so I do apologize for that let me actually scrub through just a little bit more in the beginning to make sure I didn't miss anything hey Leonard how you doing I'm doing well Oh, George. Okay, George Ramos. Great question, actually. Going back, what if you have it on the right? I'm assuming you're talking about mirror and welding. Test, test, test. Yo, yo, yo. All right. Thank you, Rethion Studios. Andrew, perfect. Let's go back to that question real quick. That is a great question, and I think you're going to love the answer for this. Let's go back to the side pillar, and I'm going to go ahead, and we're going to do something right here. No plastic. I see you. Thank you so much. All right. I'm going to go ahead and delete this side right here. So delete hidden. Okay. So the way me, uh, mirror and weld typically works is that it takes a look at everything on the left side and then it propagates it to the right side. However, there is something that's really cool. If there is literally nothing here on the left-hand side and you only have an object on the right-hand side, as long as if we turn on the floor, you can see here, as long as it is past the world center and there's nothing on the left side and only on the right side, as soon as you hit mirror and weld, it will propagate that on the proper side. Um, however, it is more ideal for you to, did I delete hidden? Is that what happened? Okay, great. Um, so it's more ideal to be working on the left to the right side here, but I've had it work this way as well. When you go ahead, there's nothing over here, mirror and weld, it, po it populates that. But like I said, ZBrush looks here on this side first. So if there's nothing here and it's only here, then mirror and weld should work. If mirror and weld is not working for you, then all you really need to do is you can actually mirror that. So you can actually find that under your subtool master. You can hit subtool master here and do a mirror and then it will ask you on which axis you would like to work on, and that works on both sides. But Mirror and Weld does it equally as fast, and it doesn't matter which side you start from as long as there's nothing on the left side. Hopefully that answers your question. I do apologize for missing that. Okay, this guy needs to just go, go, go. And block you. All right. 
Perfect. Howdy. What has happened in Spear Chuck? Okay, great. I mirrored well from the right the other day and it worked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why. That is absolutely why. So let's go ahead and actually boop, boop, boop. Let's control Z that back to where we wanted it to be. Perfect. All right. I do appreciate everybody for bearing with me on the YouTube comments. Cheers to you guys. You guys are awesome. All right, we've only been going for an hour, and I'll tell you right now, we're going to have some more fun, and then we're almost, we're actually, we're getting right to where we want to be. Okay, so we got the water. So we have this, we have this sub-tool right here. Let's actually minimize that sub-tool. That's our, that's our naming convention. Let's just minimize that. It doesn't need to be there. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> the well master perfect all right now we're gonna make the bucket let's make the bucket because the bucket's super fun so what we're gonna do for the bucket <clears throat> so we're actually going to we're actually gonna start with a really cool trick which is initializing your object before you actually go to make polymesh 3d and i use this a lot and i definitely think it's very viable so in order to do that Let's go ahead and save. I think I just did, but whatever. I'm going to go ahead and hit this little icon right up here, which is a simple basic brush. I'm going to go ahead and switch to that and hit Control N to clear that. And that puts us at like the beginning of the brush. Now I'm going to click our simple brush and I'm going to hit cylinder and I'm going to drag this out. Now, if I hit T on the keyboard or go to edit mode, if I hit the wireframe, you'll notice here that this whole cylinder is white and it's just basic. It's just like a basic white tool. What's neat about this is when you first start up ZBrush and you go straight into edit mode, you actually have some features available to you that you didn't have um, once you hit make polymesh 3D. So if we go to initialize, right down here, we can actually control the shape of this object. So I'm actually going to want to drop its H divide, and we're gonna drop this down Let's say something like, let's go, let's go even. Let's go 12, just like that. And then we'll leave some of these edge loops here, but we're gonna taper the top a little bit, just like this. Cause that's how our bucket's gonna look. If I were to flip this up, I'm looking at it upside down. We're gonna do something like that. And we have the starting of a bucket, okay? Now, if I go to make polymesh 3D, notice how the polygroup color changed. And now I have a subtool that I have my sculpting abilities on. But let's say I don't like this. Well, I can actually go back up here to my subtool list and I can come back in. And this is still before I make polymesh 3D. And I can initialize that further if I choose. So it's a really cool way to get some fun shapes. And I really like the shape right here. So we're gonna go ahead and go to our sub tool. We'll go to copy. We'll come back to our well underwater and we're gonna paste this here. And now we can start working on this bucket. Let's go ahead and hit solo. Rotate this around, scale this down. And we're gonna place this bucket. Now this is gonna be a mighty big bucket, just FYI. <laughs> Save and hydrate, thank you, sir. Saving and hydrating. Now let's go ahead and make this bucket what we want it to be. So we have this top portion here. I'm gonna go ahead and go BZM for Z modeler, hover over that edge. I'm gonna go ahead and keep the same, eh, we'll just, yeah, let's, Let's keep the same poly group. And let's create an inside like such. There we go. Oh my, oh my gosh. Wow, that channel is just like, not even playing around. All right, so we have this right here. Now let's actually push this in a little bit. So we're actually gonna just come around and select highlight these intersections, I'm just holding Alt 
And with the Z modeler, I'm just tapping in. Hover over that edge. Actually, let's change the poly group. Boop. So if I change the poly group, what I have to do is touch and hold and then hit Alt, and that will change my poly group. And now let's do Q mesh. Okay. And if I push this in, I'm just going to go in a little bit. We don't need to go too, too much because we're going to, again, we're going to be printing this, so we need this to be solid, but we'll, we'll indicate a little bit of water here on top. Hover over this edge and let's add a few polygroups here just to hold some detail and a few here to also hold some detail. And that's that right there is going to be the starting of our bucket. Now what we could do is come in here and we're actually going to do radial symmetry. So we had 12 sides. So if we come up to transform, activate symmetry, turn on the Y axis because we're working up and down, turn on radial symmetry and let's type in 12. We now have 12 points of contact. So we're hitting all of our edges. So that's the other benefit of initializing this is I knew exactly how many edges there were at the time that we did that. So now what I could do is hover over here. Let's go to bevel. Let's go with partial loop and we're going to bevel this just a little bit. Now we're going to want to make it kind of big because we're printing it. Okay. Now I'm going to select this row right here. And now this is the power of Q mesh. I'm going to hover over this edge, Q mesh, all those polygroups. When I push this in, it's actually going to cause a snap function and it's going to help snap to that inner side. So we get something like that. Now we're collapsing a little bit on the bottom because we don't have any uh, supporting edge loops. So if I turn off symmetry for a second, let's go to insert, tap that just so we get the right amount of supporting edge loops. And let's actually make one more there. There we go. So now when I hover back over here with Q mesh and I snap that in, it's gonna snap to those points there, giving me that look. And if I were to hit D for dynamic, we could start seeing something really cool, but we're gonna wanna not have it bevel so much. So going back to that polygroup question, why did I have the polygroup normals and then crease edges? So if I were to go here to crease polygroups and hit D, it actually will, will round off anything that's not creased. Now I don't like that, so let's actually uncrease that. Let's go to polygroups, group by normals, and we could change this to let's say like 25. And yeah, something a little bit fancier. Now we can go to crease polygroups. And now I can sub up a little bit and I can have a little bit of a sharper edge if I would like. And that's because we really want those cutting details as much as possible. You're over here now, I had to see what crazy stuff was happening in this chat. <laughs> nice. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I don't know why Restream disconnected it, but it is what it is. Yo, we ain't caught the stream you had with Marlon yesterday. Great stuff. Thanks for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. That, that is a great segue to an awesome stream yesterday with Marlon. We went over blocking out a head. And so I'm going to take this opportunity because we're actually almost done building this thing. I'm going to take this opportunity real quick to just uh, to showcase that, uh, or at least point you guys to that stream. I think you guys will really love it. So let's come over here, especially if you were working on, um, if you're working on likeness, or if you're working on um, just blocking out a head, it was super amazing. So let's actually get that link for you guys real quick. There it is. It was about an, a little over an hour and a half, but what was really cool um, is uh, what was really cool is we were actually able to. Um, yeah, that's fine. Just do that real fast. Yeah, great channel. Um, it was really cool because he was able to go through it so quickly, and it was really really nice. I'll get the link on YouTube in just one second. Let's pop this back out. There we go. So there is the link for that video. If you guys would like to check that out. Really awesome stuff yesterday. Okay, let's continue on forward. 
So we have our bucket here. I'm going to scale it down just a little bit more. There we go. Perfect. It's a kind of a tiny it's kind of a tiny little bucket, isn't it? All right. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create the 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 points of the bucket are supposed to hold it together because this cut is supposed to represent a, um, a separation between wood planks. So now what we're going to do is I'm actually going to duplicate this. So let's first call this our bucket. And then we're going to sh control shift D duplicate that. We're going to drop the subdivisions down to nothing, delete. Actually, you know what? Let's go back. Before I do that, I'm actually going to leave that one alone. I'm going to take this bucket here. I'm going to go back in time to this right here. I'm going to control shift D duplicate that. Push this one more back in front. There we go. So I'm utilizing the history right now. So instead of actually blocking off this one in particular, I'm going to go back into a point where our bucket was like this. And I'm going to just utilize these straps here. So the cool thing about having history on the top is that if I were to hit Control Z, that backs me up. If I hit Control Shift Z, that sends me forward. So by using the history, I could actually come back to a state I like. Control Shift D, duplicate, and that doesn't remove any of that history. Then go back in time, still have my original design, and now use this space here. I'm going to hover over this edge loop. I'm going to go poly group, and I'm going to create a couple points of contact. Select those, and I'm going to go ahead and delete hidden. So now I have my banners going that way. Hey, Spear Chuck, it's me again. Hello. Do my distance test again? Yes, absolutely. We will do that here in a second. Apologies, I got lost. No worries. Where are you lost? And we'll answer that question. Uh, Jesse Pixel or Pixie. Sorry, I didn't mean to read your name wrong. Yes, okay. So let's go back to the bucket. So with my history state up here, the very top, we have our history state. So if I wanted to utilize, so I'm basically, I am trying to create the little pieces of metal that are going to hold the bucket together, so to speak. So what I can do is by holding Control Shift or Control Z, sorry, that backs me up in time. Control Shift Z sends me forward in time through this timeline. So if I go to a point in which, like this right here, I backed up Control Z to this location. I go to Subtool Duplicate. As soon as I hit Duplicate, it creates a new subtool. If I go back to my original subtool, you'll notice I still have my timeline up here, my history state was not lost. I now hit Control Shift Z and go back in time or go back to the state that I would last left off. You can also grab the slider up here and find that spot just by dragging it across. Um, when you get a lot of history built up over time, um, you, this gets smaller and smaller. So coming up and grabbing that might be just sometimes might be a little difficult to see. So that's why I use Control Shift Z and Control Z to back up and send forward. Hopefully that explains that a little bit better. Not a problem. Okay, let's go ahead and save this real fast. Perfect. And now we have these, these little bands that are encompassing our bucket, okay? Now we don't need this bucket anymore. So we're gonna go ahead and delete that one. And we have this one here. So now we're going to use these bands to make it look like they're holding the bucket together. So let's actually, I wanna hide everything but the bucket and those bands just so I can focus on that. So a new feature in ZBrush, or relatively new feature I should say with the last main version change is we have these uh, subtool version uh, palettes that we can pull off of. So Number V1 has all of my subtools selected. If I click V2, I now have nothing selected. I can select only the things I want to see. 
so I don't have to keep coming down the solo all the time or holding shift, selecting everything, and then deselecting everything. I just want the bucket and this. And then when I'm done, I just hit V1, and now everything populates again. So with V2, I now have just the bucket and the bands, and I can work comfortably here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale this down. So we're just going to scale these in. Let's go ahead and mask off this top one, inverse mask by holding Alt. So then I can kind of bring this up here, make that a little bit more even. I'm going to scale it in just a little bit more till I can't see them anymore. Now they're embedded in this bucket. Now if I want to just hit solo real fast so I can work here. Now I'm going to hover over this edge and we're just going to extrude this out. Hover over this edge, Q mesh, all. Come on down and I'm going to scale this out. A little bit more, hold shift. There we go. That looks pretty good. I like that. Now we're going to bevel some of these edges and we're going to use the modeler for this. Dropped in to say hello. Hello, Kari. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So what I want to do is actually bevel these edges just a little bit to give it some pizzazz. So we're going to use the modeler for this. And all we're going to do is hover over an edge, go to insert, and now single edge loop. And I'm going to, we'll solo this out for this part. We're going to add some edge loops, supporting edge loops around the edge that we want to bevel. And I want to bevel the bottom and the top. And the distance, the distance doesn't really matter so much. What matters is that we just have supporting edge loops where we want them to be. And when I mean supporting edge loops, for anybody who's new, they're edge loops that butt up against an edge, an, a corner where you basically have a plane change. These edge loops, when you collapse it by like subdividing, it actually, those edge loops create a nice foundation for the uh, corner to then kind of fold into it. So it's a nice way to support the shape of your model. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hover over this edge of the wall, hold Alt and tap that. And you can see there that removes that corner. I'm going to do that a couple times here. Oop. And here. There you go. Now I can add a couple more supporting edge loops at the base if I would like, because now we've created basically a new plane change to that wall. So now when I go ahead and subdivide, it gives me a little bit of a nicer rounding effect. And if I don't like the support loops I added, we can go ahead and get rid of those. And then it gives me a little bit nicer of a fall off. So it's a really cool way to just give us a, a bit of a control without having to have too many active points. Smooth as butter. Hello from Jamaica. Hello, Jamaica. Welcome in. Chase cover. The closer the edge, the sharper the corner, the further apart, the smoother the edges. Absolutely well said. Absolutely. So now we have something that we like. Now we can go ahead and add in a little bit of fun detail. I'm actually going to go ahead and let's actually scale this up just a little bit more. Perfect. How much time per day do you spend for 3D? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I would say on average, I am in 3D between six to eight hours plus other stuff. Depends depends on what I'm working on. Um, some days some days I am prepping for streams or I'm prepping for tutorials, so um, I might spend a little less time than that uh, because a lot of it might just be like script writing or such, but for the most part, yeah, I would say when I'm in a project, easily, even then, I go home and I, I sculpt at home. So I'm, I'm always in 3D some way or another. It's because I love it. I just love doing it. Let's add a couple edge loops to support these, make those corners a little bit sharper. Yeah, there we go. That's the look I'm going for. Do the same here. 
So you can have a lot of control with making these edge loops work in your favor, give you that shape that you're going for. Now, we're going to turn on radial symmetry. So we're going to go up to transform, radial symmetry. Oh, 12, perfect. We already have it activated, which is nice. Now, right here at this point in between, I want to add rivets. So I'm actually going to go to insert multiple edge loops. And I'm going to create some edge loops here, which will give me points of contact. These rivets will be like if we hammered them and riveted them together, like we wrap something around and then nail them together. Because it's a miniature, we're going to need to go relatively small in size, but we want a big shape. So we're going to do sim simply grabbing an IMM brush and ZBrush, hitting B and then hitting I. And then we have a slew of stuff. We have industrial parts, machine parts, model kit. We can, we can search one of these. Let's actually search model kit here. And this is going to give us some cool shapes that we might want to play with. And I want kind of a round little fastener. So I think actually I'm going to go with something like this guy right here. And now I can drag these out. If I hold shift, it'll snap to that point. Or what I can do is just drag it out how I want. Boom, just like that. And kind of create that, blow it up. Let's turn on local sim like we've done before. Scale that in, push them in. And we'll repeat that process down here at the bottom. Scale that in. So it gives us that kind of shape. Now let's go back to version one zoom out and see if our model is giving us the look and feel that we want and this is actually looking pretty nice so i'm liking that now you can notice let's save real fast that you might not see the rivets too well from here so that might be too small detail but i kind of like them so we'll leave them for now um i actually i'm i actually these glasses um they're um they are with the uv protective uh uh, and blue screen filter, but actually, um, I think my eyes are just going out. <laughs> They're actually prescription. Not a strong prescription, but just enough. I usually don't have strength to work on personal projects after work. Ugh, sometimes, I will tell you, yeah, sometimes um, it gets a little tough. But I love creating, so what's sleep? Come on. <laughs> hey, Hopper Sean, what's up? How nice to catch one of your streams again. Yeah, I actually stream at this time normally. Um, this one we're doing a very specific how it's made. So anybody who's coming in who's new to the stream, um, I do stream at this time every Wednesday from noon to two. And every once in a while we're doing a how it's made. And here we are making a miniature that we're giving away the STL. Um, the STL will be part of a newsletter and we'll also have a link in the description below for this STL once it's propagated and tested for print. And so if you're, if you would like this STL, we're going to do the newsletter, go to, uh, go to ZBrush, uh, I still go to, I think it's still pixelogic.com website, go to the ZBrush website and then, um, sign up for the newsletter and you'll get notified when this thing comes live. Can I demonstrate using the lazy mouse? Absolutely. Yes. The lazy mouse is really, really cool. Um, I'll demonstrate that real quick and then we're going to move on because we will be making um, all the way to completion and we're going to be we're going to probably stay over a little bit lazy mouse time let's insert a cylinder let's solo that out for a second so the lazy mouse really cool feature so let's just get a standard brush for now subdivide this a few times so the lazy mouse your typical brush has no lazy mouse feature on it it's just typically a very low it'll capture every motion but if you go up to stroke, and let's actually pin this, clicking this little icon and dragging over. Boop. So with lazy mouse, if it's off, we come here to lazy mouse and turn that on. And now we have lazy step, lazy radius, lazy smooth, lazy snap. A lot of the times I'm just gonna mess with lazy radius because it's set to one. And notice here, there's no, there's no little tail. But if I were to go to lazy radius, and let's just go up to like 53, 
when I start to drag, notice, let's zoom in, notice there's a little red tail that starts to follow. Let's actually increase that further. And so what's cool is you won't start to draw until that tail gets to a certain point. And the bigger the lazy radius is, the longer that tail is. Now what's cool about lazy radius as well is when you're drawing, doop, 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 and I wanna stop, I wanna make a 90 degree angle, I could just, I don't have to pick up my mouse. Just start drawing, just pivot, come on down. That was a bad example. Start drawing, pivot, come down. Or I can hold shift, draw out, let go, and it draws a nice shape for me. And you just play with this as much as you want. Lazy smooth will give you a little bit of a smoother transition. Lazy snap will help snap to other part. The thing to remember too is that if you're really interested, lazy snap is more really, really fun stuff. But if you're really interested in like what it does, hover over that object and hit control and it'll actually tell you Lazy Snap Slider will control the brush icon snap distance to the end of the most previous drawn stroke. So it's really helpful to know what that is. It doesn't normally, the um, the ability to hover over something and hit control tells you what that is. It's a really cool feature of ZBrush because we understand that there's a lot going on in the program. So if you hover over a menu and hit control, it's not gonna tell you. But if you open that menu, hover over an object, um, or a feature and then hit control, it will tell you exactly what that does. So that's that's a really cool, yeah, it's a really quick, interesting breakdown of lazy radius. Kind of went through that fast, I do apologize. This uh, naked HD XYZ keeps coming back even though I've reported and blocked, so fun. Lazy Snap is beautiful. It really is. I use Lazy Snap the most when I am doing some sort of carving or cutting um, and using a chisel brush, it's definitely the one of the best ways to get clean cuts. Um, I also use it with uh, Morph Target. So, boop, bring that menu back. Wrong one, let's go to the tool. Let's have a little icon there. There we go. All right. So hopefully that was helpful. Perfect. Let's go ahead and continue our how it's made. All right. So now I want to have like some rope here on top. Okay, and the way we made the bucket is very similar to how I'm gonna make that quote rope. So I'm actually gonna go, let's save real fast. I might move a little quick just so that we stay on time, but feel free to continue asking your questions. So we're gonna go to simple brush. We're gonna click this again and switch on over. Control N will clear that viewport. And now I'm gonna pick the Helix 3D. I'm gonna draw this out, and just like we did with the bucket, I'm gonna hit T for edit mode, go down to initialize under tool. I'm gonna to pick the, the thickness, and I'm actually going to hold control, take that point and drag that out. And that's gonna give me a little bit more of a straighter wrap. And then I'm going to mess with some of these settings. Coverage, we can help play with some stuff here. Let's actually turn thickness down. Let's hide that menu, click close. And then we can actually subdivide a little bit if we would like, give us a little bit more resolution. I don't want it to be hollow, so we're not gonna hit H, but we want something like this. Okay. And now I'm gonna go ahead and from here, make poly mesh 3D, go back to sub tool. I'm gonna copy it. And now we're gonna go back to my tool set here and I'm gonna go ahead and paste. Now for the bucket, let's actually merge the everything together on that because we have this here. So I'm gonna go ahead and accept my dynamic subdivision. And then we're gonna merge the bucket to the metal components, merge down, because it's gonna get printed, so we might as well merge it now. Rodeska, hey, what's happening? It really does, yeah. I went ahead and blocked it right now. Thank you so much. Hey, Ian, how would you go about making uh, symmetric hard surface armor clothing pieces and post characters? Having trouble with concept pieces and dynamic concept workflow. Feels like ZBrush is limited in working on symmetrical pieces that are not global or assigned. 
That's a really great question. That's actually super in-depth question. So I'm going to note that. And if there's time at the end of the stream, we'll go ahead and we'll we'll uh, cover some solutions. Um, out the gate, I would want to say that maybe start with symmetry to make your hard surface and then create it, create like a nano mesh brush would be a great way to then propagate and then work on the the individual and then when it's placed. But that's all. That's a pretty big question and for this video we're doing and, and how it's made but at the end we can we can cover some stuff if you stick with so great question and if we don't get to it this video I'm gonna copy it right now and I'm gonna paste it into a notepad so that I have it and we can cover that in another stream for sure because there's a lot there to unpack so I do have it right here just so you know I am noting it QA A hotkey T to access initialize menu. No, so um, T is, is entering edit mode. So if you would like to enter, so let's actually go back. Let's go to simple, let's go to switch, clear this out. So when you first start ZBrush, you get something like this and you have simple brush and maybe one or two tools up here. When you grab the simple brush and you bring up a simple cube, for example, right now you're kind of in just this weird mode where you draw stuff out. So you draw this out and then up here is edit mode. If I hit T, this brings me into a mode in which I can edit my subtool before I actually sculpt on it. So in this mode, notice how the polygroups are white. I'm actually able to come on down and adjust it under the initialize feature. I can actually make this however I want. So if I want to twist this object, add some subdivision, and create some really cool fancy shapes real fast right something like that now it before i can just start sculpting on it because if i were to come up here and start grabbing a brush which you can do you can't come up here and say like, oh let's let's go and spiral it's going to tell you whoop you selected the brush but you can't do it you need to you need to make it a 3d primitive so this up here you have access to it but you can't do anything and might be confusing. So the edit mode allows you to prep your subtool, make polymesh 3D appear under the tool menu, allows you to now start sculpting on it. But you see it propagated that shape for me. So now I brought in a custom subtool. That's exactly what we did with the helix. We brought the helix over, we changed the helix into a basic shape. So we started here, we moved it to a basic shape, and now we have it in here in which we're going to edit it. So hopefully that answers that question for you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really cool. Yeah, it's a fun it's a fun one. Okay, let's go ahead and clean this out. So we're going to speed up just a little bit, <laughs> but we're going to go ahead and add this here cuz we want that quote that rope is there. It's it's holding the bucket. And let's actually, we're gonna fake it till we make it on the rope itself. So what we're gonna do is kind of bury the shape in just a little bit. because we wanna collide this mesh. And the detail of this is gonna be so small that it's not really gonna matter too, too much how it looks. So we're going to subdivide a little bit and we're just going to kind of blow this up. Hold. Here, let's actually expand that out. This is where when you're making a miniature, the thing to remember is details. Again, the detail size matters. So we want to make sure that we can read all that detail. So maybe we will make this bucket just a little bit bigger. Right? Scale that back. I can still see the shape, but let's actually Let's scale this down just a little bit. Okay. Okay, let's see here. Um, 
Uh, this might be outside the scope of the video, but can you make your own primitives with edible properties or is that a hard coded thing? Um, well, when you bring it, you could, any brush you bring in, <coughs> that's a great question. You know what? I would have to play with it. I don't know off the top of my head if you could actually do that because the brush will yell at you when trying to do that. But if you wanted to design your own primitive shapes and then from there um, have them, yeah, I, I don't know. Let me, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know if you'd be able to do that. I want to say that you won't be able to do that, but I've never tried. But I would imagine based on what we just went through that you would not be able to do that. Yeah, exactly. Ryan's tools is some really cool stuff. Another streamer of ours who does some neat, neat stuff. And, um, but yeah, I, I'd have to try it. Believe it or not, I, there are some things I still am learning myself. So, okay, let's move it through. No, you can make your own IMM brush, but to to initialize it itself you know what let's answer the question real quick here so here's a primitive right here so if i understand the question correctly you want to try to bring in an imm brush to then initialize it if that's if i'm reading the question right in the initialized state in the first edit state even with an imm brush i can't bring it out now i can initialize this itself taper it and then I can go to make polymesh 3d and then I can make this an IMM brush by hitting brush and then saying create insert and if I had multiple ones boop, 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 and then go to brush create multiple insert brush sure but you would want to edit your initial shapes first and then add to this brush so unless I'm misunderstanding the question you would not be able to go to an initialized mode with an IMM brush because it won't let you. To work with a brush, you have to be able to be in 3D, make Polymesh 3D. Okay. So let's go back here. Yep. Okay, let's go ahead and continue. Uh, the, let's see, got a question. What is the square that appears in your cursor? Oh, that's um, that random square thing. That's actually an OBS uh, default. Um, that it, it's a weird little thing where it's screen grabbing the, the screen and it's causing a weird little bug. Whoa, we really, okay. This guy again. <laughs> Wow, YouTube, YouTube. All right, let's create the handle of the bucket. And we're gonna do really a really simple trick with this. You guys ready for this one? So we're gonna call this our rope, okay? And we're gonna go ahead and insert a new, uh, a new cylinder. So we're gonna go ahead. Actually, we have one up here, our base cylinder here. I've messed with a bunch of those cylinders already. So I have this guy right here. I'm gonna go ahead and control shift D. And we're gonna name this uh, bucket handle. And we're gonna drop this all the way down. Okay, I think you guys are gonna like this one. This is a fun one. Bucket handle, boop, 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 boop. Let's actually move this up. Wow, keep blocking this guy. Report, yes, we don't want it, stop. Okay, let's actually come here. Let's solo for a second. Let's go to 90 degrees. Let's put this up, the scale is here. So I wanna create a handle shape. So I'm actually, we're gonna start large and then we'll scale it down. So I'm actually gonna put this out here. I'm gonna scale this just about there. So now with the gizmo, I'm super centered too much yeah it, uh, it's really annoying actually so we're going to we're going to bend this this is going to be really fun so we have this right here so with a gizmo we're going to open up this little 
this little cog right here. And we're going to go to Bend Arc. And it's going to be really, really cool because we're going to be able to actually play with some stuff. Like this. Really simple. So we have all these different... So like the soft deformer we did with the uh, crank, with the crankshaft, we're actually going to pick a angle and we're just going to start bending this. So we have this handle right here. It's, it's really cool. So let's do that again. Let's go back to the gizmo, go here to our cog, go to bend arc. We're going to find the right angle. I'm just going to be looking at it from the top, grabbing this green cone and start pulling this down. And we're going to go at least, let's go 90 degrees. Come back up here to the cog, accept. That's it. We got our handle. That simple. <laughs> Come in here, add it to the top. Now, of course, we could play with this however we would like to play with this, but we're going to go ahead and deselect everything here. Hold Control Shift and Alt. We're going to tap here the bucket and this, and we're going to go ahead and populate this where we think it's going to fit. And now let's actually, with symmetry turned on, we can actually scale this in a little bit. Something like that. Now we're going to want to make sure this is printable. And that could be, that could prove to be slightly interesting. So with something like a shape like this, we're going to add in some water here in a second. And then really make sure that this thing... Looks like it's holding on to it for dear life. So we're gonna swell this up a little bit. We're gonna move a little faster. And let's, again, let's pull it back and let's just take a look at it. We don't need to, with miniatures, you don't need to try to make everything seem super realistic. We just need it to be believable. So when we come back here, it's like, uh, yeah, that, that's starting to look like that holds on there. If you focus too much on the details, you're, you might lose a lot of that detail. So you spend hours working on that detail just to find out it doesn't even work. So be careful when, um, when zooming all the way in and saying, oh, there's not enough detail there. You might lose a lot of it in the print process. So just be careful. But here we're going to go ahead and push this in a little bit and make sure that collides. So when we read it from back here, it's like, oh, he wrapped that bucket up so it stays there. Let's go ahead and save it. Yes, you would absolutely uh, decimate before you print it out. The more you block, the math the harder it is, right? Yeah, I know, right? Um, how many polys will I have? Uh, it depends, Noah Games. Um, I'm going to try to keep it under a million because I don't need that much detail. Um, so that way, when I Dynamesh it, we'll keep it at least around there. But I'm going to decimate it down to, like, maybe 200,000 points. Maybe. That's not going to be a whole lot. <laughs> Mike Pad, what's up, man? The majority of my career has been spent making details that didn't matter. <laughs> oh, man, I feel you. I feel you there. So, okay. So we got this here. Welcome in, welcome in. Uh, let's see, those transformer tools are really powerful, simple. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, come here to the gizmo. Open up this cogwheel right here. Th just play with some of this stuff. I All the students I teach, I just tell them, play with this, please. Play just... Figure out if it works. You know, does it work for you? What does it do? Um, each one is different and neat, and it's super cool. So try them out. Just the same thing with the brushes itself. You know, like right here, I want to finesse this because I think it looks super hideous. But we're running out of time. So, and we're going to finish this. So I'm not leaving until we finish. <clears throat> All right, let's get to detailing. <laughs> so I'm going to save this now as uh, Blackout 3. 
and we're going to get to some detailed stuff here. So wood, wood texture. We're going to make a fun little brush. That's going to be really, really simple. And I think you guys are going to like it because we're just going for big, nasty wood grains. Something that's going to print and be fun. So let's add some edge loops. Touch this a few times here. Oh, I didn't do it on the other side, so mirror and weld that. Turn on symmetry. Great, wonderful. Now what we could do to add like a little bit of, so it looks like this is uh, two separate pieces and not just two pieces that are colliding with each other. What we could do is come over here and actually grab these right here up on the top. Hover over the edge, Q mesh, and let's actually plop that down a little bit. Do that a few times. There we go. That looks pretty cool. And now we can bring this down. We still have it collide and touch just a bit on the bottom side. Okay. Let's actually mask this section off here. Kind of flatten that back out. And now these are going to be technically like old and kind of rotting a bit. So we can add just a little bit of asymmetry to it. But as long as these two objects are touching in some way, it's going to be fine because they'll weld together correctly when we print, when we prep for print. But that's going to give us kind of a nice little feel as if this was actually built the way we want. Although it might be too small to matter with details, speaking of details, but we got to do something. Doop, 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 doop. Are you up to go? Yes, this will be recorded. Uh, uh, Jesse Pixie, this will be recorded. The VOD will be up. So definitely. Let's see here. Um, is there a size average for how much detail you should add? Like probably can't add detail or texture detail to something with a few inches tall. So yeah, so the size range is 25 millimeters to 38 millimeters. Um, Honestly, like the, the trick I do is um, I kind of zoom it down to something like this small. And if I can kind of see the textures, um, that's a decent indication. But you, when you're printing miniatures for the first time and building them from scratch, there will be a little bit of trial and error. Um, you lose about, I want to say like 10 to 15% detail when printing in resin, depending on your printer. So there's a chance that you'll build something and it just won't be enough and you'll want to make adjustments, which is a good reason why you could save project files when prepping, because then you can always go back and repunch those details. Um, the fewer the lines and the deeper the line, the easier it will be to read that texture. So if you, like I said, if you zoom out and you can't really read it well, you're going to have a hard time seeing that texture, then it may not print. So just, it's not a, it's not a guarantee. It's just more of like a good way to check yourself. Can I read that print from out here? So now we're going to subdivide a few times to kind of get that texture. Now let's build that brush and you guys are going to hate how simple this brush is, but it's one of my favorite ways to do it. So I'm going to hit B, D, S, damn standard. I'm going to go up to my stroke and go to spray. I'm gonna go down to my alpha and do alpha 60. And we're gonna do some fun stuff here. We're gonna add some texture. Now, one thing I will do real quick is we're gonna go to brush. We're gonna go to auto masking and ma back face mask. I'm gonna up the resolution a little bit. Nice big brush. Boom. Now what's really cool here is what you can do even further is to punch these details. Let's go to deformation and we're going to go to contrast and we're going to bump up that contrast. And voila, easy peasy. That's all I did. <laughs> That's all I did. <laughs> and it printed out really nice actually. I'm really happy with that. And what's really cool is actually this wood texture. 
Yeah, I call it a wood texture. But what's really cool about this is um, um, we learned that uh, you could use it for a good skin texture too if you really, if you really want. I'm gonna sub this up a few times. Now, of course, subdividing, you're gonna want some subdivision levels. They're pretty good. Oops. Oh man, did I just save? I tried to do something with Z Modeler. Wrong brush. I know, and I blocked it again. <laughs> that guy is back on the escalator again. Uh oh, I got that wheel. Nice, nice, good, nice. Now, I got that blue wheel, so um, happens. I tried something with Z model. This is completely my fault if it crashes. <laughs> the wheel of weight. We're gonna go a little over the 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 two hour mark, but it's gonna be okay. We have our next streamer isn't until for my time, so we'll we'll be we'll be good. Boop. This might be a thing where I just like turn it off and on again. Well, Ian, did you get the ZBrush hat as well? I do have a ZBrush hat, but it's all the way over there. I'm not much of a hat person. I'm more of a beanie person, and my mission is to get a beanie. Okay, there it goes. All right, you know what? We so let's go back and do it again. That is uh, unofficially my fault. So <laughs> that's that's me breaking it. Um, I would I would go to the ZBrush website and just uh, and see what's on there. I'm I'm not too sure what's in inventory. I can't answer that question. All right, there we go. Don't don't do a Z model or drag like like I just did and and expect it all to happen. All right, let's rebuild that brush. The damn standard spray. It's a really good time to go over that. Alpha sixty, brush, auto masking, back face mask. Select your your bad boy here. Drag that up. Whoops. More detail. Yeah, break it. There we go. Actually, you know what we want to do? Oop. There, we there we go. Beautiful. All right, let's try this one more time. Z modeler. Don't do it, Ian. Don't do it. Do this. Bop, 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 bop. Bah. Oop, bah. There we go. Run, two, three, four. Now let's go back to my damn standard brush. If you guys are interested in this brush, we'll go ahead and also make sure to put that in the newsletter. Boom. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> if I want to be now, I'm gonna have to learn how to knit. <laughs> Probably. All right. Now we're gonna just do a quick little check ourselves here. So punch those details. There we go. Real nasty choppy, but as soon as we dynamesh that, we'll get that welded and it will look awesome. And again, back here I can see that texture. So when you 3D print this, this should be pretty cool. Do 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 do. I always used to watch your videos instead of pay attention in class. <laughs> there you go, yeah. Okay, let's make some water ripples here real quick. So with water ripples, I just like to use the standard brush. And what we're gonna do is use that lazy mouse. So we're gonna go to lazy radius, turn that up a bit. And here, I'm gonna just subdivide a couple times. And I'm actually just going to kind of go through, follow some of the outer edges, like the water's kind of pushed up against it. And I get to kind of just play around with that. You don't have to go too, too nuts. 
Just play around. Just you're getting some rippling effects. Go positive, go negative. Nice big kind of chunky details. But if you're gonna do any type of uh, resin itself to it, um, you know what? Let's actually do lazy. Let's do radius. Um, so let's go up to transform symmetry radius. Go Y. Kind of create like a little bit of a, a ripple look. Almost like maybe a rock or something pebbled in there. Add a little bit of detail for that. Again, let's zoom out. Can we see that kind of water look feel? That's pretty cool. So when you're building this yourself, it's just all about like, does this work? Does this make sense to you? Is water, water flows in odd ways. What you could do too is go like uh, snake hook. Let's turn off our RGB. And if we hold alt, we can pull along an axis. So we could do something like that and get some pretty cool stuff. Now it looks like we got YouTube comments back on the uh, um, on the on the such. Uh, the brush has an effect on the alpha. You won't have the same effect between a standard and a dampener with alpha. Uh, al yes, the alpha affects the brush. The alpha actually gives you texture and um, applies a little bit differently. So with a different alpha, will give you a different brush for sure. Or, uh, sorry, a different alpha will give you a different look. Yes. Let's actually calm that down there a little bit. All right. Don't forget to save. Thank you so much. Who let the bots in? Brr. <laughs> okay, I want to make sure. Darren, what's up? What are we making here? We are making a well. Okay, now let's get into some final texture stuff. So we have these bricks here. Uh, this is we're actually rounding the end um, of this uh, of the stream. Um, we can add a couple extra little things to make it look and feel a little bit more uh, neat. So let's actually come in here. I'm gonna just use the move infinite brush and kind of. Propagate this just a little bit more. Let's actually scale this up a little bit. There we go. So we're going to add some kind of rusted feel to this crankshaft. So I'm going to subdivide these a few times. Boop, boop. Let's actually add some resolution here. So BZM for Z modeler. Let's hover over that edge. And let's go with multiple insert loops. Getting small. Yep. Go ahead and grab this. There you go. There we go. Perfect. Let's do the same here. Let's grab that side. And we should have just been on symmetry, but we weren't. That's okay. I'll be that side. Perfect. Now. We're going to add a little bit of kind of like a little bit of texture. And for that, we're going to use thick skin. So we're going to turn on thick skin. If you've never used thick skin before, let's throw this out. Thick skin, what it will do is it will actually, I'm going to turn off my high resolutions. We don't need that. With thick skin, it's actually going to kind of give a, a border of how far that geometry is going to extend out to. And so with thick skin, you can get some really cool results because we can pluff it up like this. And then we'll grab any brush, doesn't matter, although there is an actual thick skin clay brush that we can use. And if you wipe one way, you get a different result, wipe the other way. And what we could do is we can actually, let's lower the intensity. And we can actually play around and get some really cool stuff. Now, the real cool thing with thick skin is that if you wanna drag out uh, like some clay and then hit one to repeat that action, you can actually see how it flattens out at some point. So with that being said, I'm actually gonna take clay build up here. 
And with clay buildup, I'm going to get alpha 6. And I'm actually just going to go ahead, add a little bit of funkiness to this. Okay, just a little bit, just so it looks a little weird. Boop, boop, boop. And then I'm going to grab that thick skin. And now these textures might go away a little bit. Let's hit back face mask. And that's just going to give us a neat little look. Maybe it's been sitting there a while. And we could do that with the other one. Thick skin. Boop. There we go. That's a little too much, I think. There we go. So we just get to kind of play around a little bit. I broke it. There we go. Something like that. Very cool. And just kind of play. So with thick skin, it'll cap me a little bit. But when we're done, we could just turn that off. And now we have a little bit of results. If we do turn it off by accident, it is control Z. You can bring that back, which is really nice. So you don't have to worry too, too much about that. Ivy tuber plants uh, up the stonework. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna rush through the rest of the details here, even though we keep getting this guy popping back here. Jeez, jeez, oh jeez. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Google told me this, and then I'm able to <laughs> make fun without making any motion to it. So, the <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> okay. All right, let's go ahead and on our mortar here, let's actually add a little bit of uh, some detail. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and grab the standard brush, that's B, S, and T, and I'm gonna grab spray, and I'm gonna grab an alpha, I think I'm gonna go with alpha 23. And this is just gonna add some detail. And that grout work. Okay. A little bit of detail like that. Again, we may not see that, but for the model, it could look really cool. Now we're going to go over one other way to apply detail like that, and that's actually going to be with noise. Now, earlier in the stream, somebody had said, why did I add polygroups? And part of the reason was for the crease by polygroups in order to subdivide without it rounding too much. Another really cool way is if we were to go back to subdivision level one for a second, or go up to UVs, we're going to go to UV master, and we're going to go ahead and work on a clone. By doing this, we're gonna go ahead and go to polygroups and group by normals. And now we're gonna go back up to UV master, turn off symmetry, polygroups, and unwrap by polygroups. This will give us some pretty clean UVs to apply noise texture to. So we go ahead and unwrap, go back to Z plugin and go to flatten. Here's our wall and its texture. All the polygroups are separated. So now we can go unflatten, copy UVs, go back to our model, go to plugin and paste UVs. Now we have UVs on here. And if we wanna check, just go to down at the bottom, we have UV map and we can see here we have a morph UV that's now activated. So now we can go to surface, go to noise, and we can actually access our UVs and we can actually generate a noise plugin. So we can either do a noise plugin here or hit cancel and go to noise lightbox. And let's just grab a texture that's already in existing. 
So we have noise 15 here, I think is pretty cool. So let's double click that and that's gonna start to apply that texture. And you can see here, it's actually doing a pretty decent job giving me what I want. Let's grab a different material so you can see it a bit better. Is that really? Okay. Let's go ahead and apply that. It's applying that material, boom. So you can see that. Now we can go to edit and we can actually edit this. We can edit the color. We can edit its strength. How heavy do we want that? And even the scale of it. We can make them really small. We can make them really big. It's up to you. Let's actually go a little bit bigger than you would think just because of what we're doing. We can even adjust the scale. Now that we have UVs, we can actually really stretch and change the angle and really manipulate this texture to our advantage. Having those UVs are gonna be really helpful because it's now wrapping along the bricks instead of just kind of on the bricks, which is what 3D. And actually we could just turn, actually that was just 3D. Boom, go to UV, we can <laughs> adjust that even further. Let's go back over here. So we have a lot of control with this, however we want. So it's up to you how you want to do that. But this is a really cool feature to do. I like it a lot. Let's come here, scale that down. Boom, say okay. Now we have brick texture that's on there. That is really, really helpful. And if you ever don't like it, go back and say, oh, you know what, I really liked it, how it looked here on the edit side. I didn't really care for it so much on the 3D versus the UV. Again, all the things you can do, you just figure it out. And if you're not sure, just cancel it and it'll keep what you would like. So a lot of really cool ways to play with it. Uh, would the details show up on the filament? Most likely not at the size that you'd be printing at. Right now we'd be printing at about 30 millimeter, give or take a few millimeter. That's what I'm gonna scale it to. So no, filament may not capture this detail at all. Um, resin would, if you made it a much larger print, then absolutely it would do a lot better of a job, but just mm, filament, not so much. I feel like I'm just being attacked by this guy here. Hello, is it possible to add 3D meshes to an insert in a pen tool menu? So you can have them whenever they are whenever you want. Yes, you can absolutely. <laughs> no, it's not you, trust me. Yeah, if you create something that you really, really like um, and you wanna add it to an IMM brush, so for example, let's say I really like these bricks. I like these bricks a lot and I'm gonna wanna keep these bricks. So I'm actually going to, first things first, let's go to surface and apply this mesh so that we have that detail. And let's actually subdivide that a little bit more. Okay, so let's say I really like these bricks and I wanna actually save one of these bricks out in my IMM brush. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and just create a new IMM brush. So let's just, let's just create a fun one. Let's just go up here to the cylinder Make polymesh 3D real fast, because we are a little bit over at this point. So at this point, if I wanted to create an insert brush, say, no, go ahead, I'm gonna make this a new one, boom. Okay, actually let's duplicate this and let's make it an IMM brush. So let's go B, create, multi-insert, okay. So at this point now, if I wanted to append anything to this, so let's say I really like these bricks. I did a great job, I love them. I'm gonna copy these bricks. I'm gonna come into here to my brush or into the sub tool I'm using to make my brush. I'm gonna go ahead and paste this. And then I'm actually gonna be breaking this up into different components itself. So I'm gonna split this into similar parts. So I'm gonna go to uh, sub tool, split, split into similar parts. Say okay. And it's gonna break this up into different parts, actually break into parts. Come on, boom, there we go. So split into parts. Now I have the one brick here that I really, really like. So now if I want to make all of this into a different, uh, in, I want to add this to my IMM brush. If I were to go here and say, create multi-insert, here's all of my bricks, all different variations. And if I wanted to add something new to that, I would say create insert mesh and append, and it should append to that. There it is, there's my new option right on top, so now I have two cylinders. So you would just go again, B, pick the subtool you want. So it's actually, let's say I want this well itself here to become part of my brush palette. So I have all these bricks and now I want the well itself. 
So I go B, create insert mesh, say append. And at the top, it's gonna say, it's gonna give me a note pressing M, blah, 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 say okay. And now I can drag that out. Of course, if I don't have my subdivisions on, boom, there it is. So really good way to make this stuff so you don't have to keep rebuilding over and over and over again. <laughs> like his pot friend fell down the well and it's just raging over there. I know, right? Okay. <coughs> We have a couple more minutes, so let's finish this up real quick. Let's actually prep this for 3D printing so that this will be a complete video for everybody to follow along. Okay, so we are here now. We have what we like. I love it. It's fantastic. Life is good. Let's make this uh, printable, okay? So at this point now, I have all my texture. I'm really happy. Let's save it first. I'm going to go ahead and hit save. And now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to merge everything together. Before I merge everything together, I want to make sure that everything is either at its highest subdivision level or if it has dynamic subdivision to go ahead and uh, bake that subdivision so it's good. Um, I believe there's actually a ZBrush plugin you can download for that. But the way I do it, just because I'm old fashioned, is I will actually have my subtool palette open and using the arrow keys, will basically allow me to see and select each subtool. Just press arrow. So I'm going to go ahead and just come on down to my geometry. I'm going to hit arrow and I'm just going to delete lower on everything real fast. So I have what I want. Now everything is at its highest subdivision level. And now I'm going to go to merge and I'm going to go to merge visible. So everything that's visible in my viewport is actually going to be combined into a brand new subtool at the top. So by merge visible, it now merged all of this together as we can see here. Okay. Now this is about 2.2 million polys. So what we're going to do next is we're going to dynamesh this together. So we're going to go ahead and I like to duplicate my subtool and work with a secondary subtool just in case something happens. And we're going to save this now as a 3D prep. So we've done our block out. We're happy with life. And now we're going to go with 3D prep. Okay. And now. Yep, absolutely. Carl creates as the exact other way to do it. Go ahead and all hide the button on the subtools. I delete everything, so I go through it one at a, one at a time. Um, but now what we're going to do is we're going to merge this. It's all merged together. Now let's dynamesh it together. Now here's what's really cool. If you go to, if you go to, um, sorry, if you go to geometry and dynamesh, you have this little thing here called picker. And what the picker will do is they'll actually, if you click and hold, it will start to, if we look at the, it's going to be hard to see, but at the resolution here, I'm going to pick and find a resolution that makes sense for the size. And I'm looking for something really dense. I'm looking for the densest number. Right now, that's actually around 560. I'm going to increase that to about 1,000 because 560 is the densest out of all of this. And then I'm going to go ahead and drop the blur to zero, and I'm going to hit Dynamesh. Now this is going to weld this completely together. This might take a second because we're welding a lot together. But since all the geometry was collided together, this should actually create a pretty seamless and pretty clean model here. And now the way to check to see if it is dynameshed completely together, one way to do it is to actually auto groups. So if we go to polygroups and autogroups, if it changes and other parts show up as different polygroups, then it is not completely welded together. So that is definitely one way to check. And you'll wanna make sure that some of that stuff is. So here I'm actually going to inflate some of this area here and make sure it's connected. I'm gonna redynamesh that. Now it's pretty gross uh, on some of these cuts here, but we wanted that so that way we can, we can see that texture when we print that thing. So that should be pretty cool. Now that we got that, 
we're going to go ahead and decimate this down. We can also inspect the inside of our mesh. If you'd like to inspect the inside of your mesh and see what's happening on the inside, there's a really cool printing trick I do. But before I do that, we're going to go to Display Properties, and we're going to flip our normals. And we're just going to take the, a look on the inside and see if there's any really weird points of contact that I'm looking for. And I'm not really seeing these floating meshes. We flip normal, so that's what we're looking at. I don't see any weird holes. So let's flip that back. And let's actually check it by inserting a new cube, something like this. I'm going to turn on my transparency. And we're going to scale this cube up to encompass the actual model. And let's bring that up at the top here. Would I use project in the Dynamesh options? That's a great question. Um, if I saw a significant amount of detail loss, yes, you could absolutely. But um, in this case, it actually, we Dynameshed at such a high, when you do a picker, so we Dynameshed at a higher resolution and higher than the uh, resolution that we discovered within the model. So we shouldn't have really had any loss of detail because the resolution of the Dynamesh was far greater than the resolution of the model itself. That's where the picker comes in really handy because we could take that picker and we can identify exactly how high or low something is. So in that case, we go to geometry here, we're telling ZBrush, okay, we find the highest resolution. We say, oh, that's 800. So if I kick up that resolution a little bit more, there should be almost no detail loss. That doesn't mean there won't be detail loss. It's just it should capture the majority. If you do experience detail loss, yeah, projecting from one subtool to another or project history will grant you the rest of the way. So that's where the picker really kind of really like reign supreme almost because it, it's, it's helping you identify where to even start. If that makes sense. Okay, now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna use live boolean. So we have our cube selected here and I'm gonna turn it to subtract. Okay, and then I'm gonna go ahead and say live boolean and we need to identify that. Wait, do I have the right one selected? There we go, hold on one second. What is happening here? My mask off, give me one second. Oh my stars. Don't break on me. Oh, I have transparency turned on. That's nice. Transparency turned on, we'll do that to you. All right, so without transparency turned on, let's have our cube select a negative and our, our well is actually paired to that cube with live volume turned on. And now what we're gonna do is use the gizmo and we're gonna start inspecting our part. So if we zoom in here, move this gizmo, we're gonna look for random holes. And this is also kind of a, a neat way to see how your print will print. All the layers, all that cool stuff. Looking for holes. Now yeah, that looks pretty good. Pretty happy with that. Yeah, that's nice. Perfect. So that kind of gives us a slice indication. So we're just looking for holes. We didn't see any, which is awesome. So now we can size this bad boy and get this ready for 3D printing. So save that. That guy is back on the escalator again. It's a 90s movie if anybody can guess it. Actually, I think he said that kid. I think it's that kid is back on the escalator again. <laughs> Can't even quote right. <laughs> all right, uh, we have a couple more minutes and we're going to kind of speed through this really quickly. Thank you all for hanging out with me. Hopefully you guys are enjoying this How It's Made process. We do plan on doing more. So, um, and again, I try to make it, I try to approach it with as the simplest mindset as possible. There's uh, like a hundred ways to do the same thing in ZBrush. So if you came in halfway and you're bearing with me to the end, this is definitely something that we can do more often if you guys like it and we can go through making stuff together. So to finalize this model, the rest of the way. Mall rats, there we go, yeah. I knew it, good, good, good. He's not giving up, that is for sure. Oh, hey, can we, uh, Zerchen, can you show an example of how a hole would look like? 
Um, yes. Let me do that at the end, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, we'll go back in time, and I'll kind of show you a way you can make a hole look like a hole without it being a hole. Um, I didn't really feel the need to do that because of how small the detail would look here. But if you would like to do that, we will do that for sure. Let's cover scaling real quick. And then we'll call it, and then we'll do the whole thing, and then we'll bounce for the rest of the day because we did go over. Okay, so to scale this, scaling is really simple. It's very, very simple in ZBrush. You have full control of the size. I, I don't recommend trying to work in ZBrush to scale. I recommend scaling after the fact because you have more control of your model during the model process when it's not set to a scale. So if we go to Z plugin and we're going to click that over here to the left hand side, we're going to go to uh, scale master. Now we have our subtool here and what I would like to do is try apply Boolean is we're just going to come on down to new bounding box subtool. The reason why we're going to do this is it's going to take my subtool on the X, Y, and Z and it's going to figure out how big this needs to be in order to encompass the bounding box. So we're going to click this. The bounding box is going to create and it's going to be perfectly to this subtool, like to the T, like perfect. So it's not a perfect cube. It's just going to be perfect to the subtool. Now that it's perfect to the subtool, we can actually come up and say set scene scale with the cube selected. Now we're going to have options, millimeters, inches, centimeters, feet. We're 3D printing, so we're going to go with millimeters. Go ahead and hit enter. Now our scene is now scaling. Now ZBrush defaults to millimeter with units. So one unit, one millimeter. But now we're actually working with this box being about 3.1, 2.9, 2.5, and all the axis. Now we're just going to size this. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up to the Y axis because I want this to be 30 millimeters tall. I'm going to go 30, enter. And now I'm going to go ahead and resize subtool with all the axis selected. And it's going to scale this up. Boop. Okay. Now that that is now that that is done, what we can do, you could just see if we look at the size he, here on the slider, it says 30 on the Y, 32 on the X and 26 on the Z. But if you really wanted to check to make sure that it is legitimately correct, go ahead and just say set scene scaled again and it'll give you that number. From here, now that that bounding box is selected, we can hide that. And now we know that this model is scaled to that, that size. Now all we have to do is just export. So we can come here with our, with our, let's rename this. We'll call this our drinking well um, 3D prepped, 3D prepped 30 millimeter tall. It's renamed. Now I'm just going to go to export to unit scale and we already have it set to millimeter export to unit scale and I can export out a single subtool to either OBJ. I could pick STL. I could pick FBX. I could pick 3MF, whichever works for you. STL or OBJ works well when it comes to 3D printing. So I'm going to go ahead and say STL and I'm going to say save. And it's going to say which STL options do you want? Visible, all your subtools, what's selected? We're going to go selected. No need to separate files. Just go ahead and say OK. And that is exported that way. Now, I have not forgotten, trust me. Now, we are, that's just exporting. Now, we will want to decimate this because we are actually pretty high. So to decimate your, your model, we're just going to go to Decimation Master. And you have these presets down here. Now, we could just go through current pre-process or, you know, we have to do pre-process, then decimation process. No need to do that. Just go to presets and say, let's go 250K to bring this down to a usable size. 
Yep, no, I did not forget, but I do appreciate you guys. <laughs> boop, boop, boop. Now, decimation takes a while. This is why I left it towards the end, because we are running out of time. This might take a second. Boop, boop, boop. Not a problem, not a problem. And yes, also too, if you would like to make sure that everything is perfectly flat the way you would like it to be, definitely go ahead and do that. But also, did I just, I did not. <laughs> but you can. Mom said, it's my turn to have the Xbox. Give me the Xbox! <laughs> Does it make a difference if you decimate or freeze border uh, uh, with freeze borders active? Um, freeze border active is an option to kind of ensure that your borders are the way you want them to be at that resolution. Um, I never use it. I don't find the need to do that. Decimation Master does a really good job not needing to do a whole lot. Um, UV and I want or poly paint. I want to keep. You could do that, but with freeze borders. Yeah, I mean, if it's something that uh, is an option you're used to using, there's nothing wrong with using it. I don't, I don't use it. Decimation Master does a great job on its own. What's up, Ashley? Um, what's the kid on the escalator thing? <laughs> that kid is back on the escalator again. Um, Mallrats, one of my favorite '90s movie. Um, it's because this guy, <laughs> this this uh, bot, has been trolling us this whole time. So appropriate. Also, too, with the Decimation Master, while it's thinking, and I'm just sitting here chatting with you guys now, the presets, I, I clicked on 250K. We're taking 7 million down to 250,000 active points. That might be a little too low. If that is too low, you have a custom slider. And as long as you keep your sub tool under a million polys, most slicers will do just fine reading that. That's the reason for Decimation. Um, but if you want a really super sharp, detailed model, um, if your slicer can handle it, you don't have to decimate so low. I try to see as low as I can go and then kick it up. But it's really up to you at that point what you would like to do. At the end of the day, you know, just find something that works. But with, deci with decimating, you're trying to preserve as much detail as possible. Um, so you could mask off areas you want to preserve, and it should be fine. What's up, Ram? I'm about ready to leave here. Take your time. Don't rush. You can overlap. I won't hate you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. It's thinking. Did we break it? No, nah, we didn't break it. Come on. That's not what we do here. Look at that. Decimated. Boom. Actually, that looks really good. Looks really good. We went from 7 million to... We went from 7 million to 248. Look at this. I'm going to control Z real quick. We went from this to this. Just I love this Mage Master. <laughs> uh, no. Okay. So, so now we do the same thing. We just go right back to uh, we go back to our scale master, export out our unit, and let's over let's overwrite that thing the way we did it. So let's go to our how it's made series, tabletop 30, save, we'll save over that because that's a much larger file. Boom, done. And also too, um, even if you decimate afterwards, if you want to make sure that the, the bottom is as flat as it can be so that it's nice and clean, um, at this point too, can use clip curve or knife uh, knife curve if you would like. Kind of clip that. Of course, if your mesh is not super clean, like I just broke it. What's up, guys? I'll just clip curve it. But you undermet where I stood. So, yay! All right, we are definitely running out of time. Let's go back here to this part. 350 million polys later. You f you freaking know it. All right. Let's take any last questions real quickly. Um, I did promise we will do the whole thing. 
Um, so let's actually just go to clip curve real quick. Boop. Should be able to just do fine. There we go, clip curve. Now we got a nice flat bottom. Export that out again. Call it a done day. Here's the cool thing, since we did turn it off and on again on purpose, because we're really cool like that. Um, if you use Scale Master to set your scene scale, and you come back and you open your file back up, all you have to do is set scene scale again, and then we'll remember your current settings. That's really important. That's the power of, set of Scale Master. So once you set scene scale again, you can then go back and export that back out and you will call it a day. Um, so to recap on that uh, knife curve real fast, if, you, if your mesh is not, um, you know, if, you're, if your mesh is a little weird, knife curve uh, does struggle a little bit. So just be careful on that or that could happen. Strike two. <laughs> uh, Ian, I hope you're well. How's Spicer doing? Haven't seen him in a while. Uh, Spicer's been super busy as far as I know. Um, him and I have chatted a couple times. Uh, and I, th I think he's just one busy dude right now. But, um, yeah. Time to put it in the... Okay. Um, blah, 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 blah. All right, real quick. So the whole thing... To, to make the hole but not it be a hole, you're just going to use... Um, a really cool trick. Let's go back to this block out too for a second. And this is what I was talking about that I thought maybe I would do this, but I really decided against it just because I didn't think it would work out too well. But I would position, so right here, we're gonna go solo real fast. And how I'm gonna wanna make a hole look like a hole without it being a hole is I'm just gonna use the modeler. And I'm gonna hover over this point and then we're gonna go to split. And we're actually going to scale this up like that. Okay. And let's actually use transparency for a second so that we know exactly how big to take something. Just like that. So if I turn on decimation, it'll look pretty good. Or I'm sorry, not decimation, uh, dynamic. I can't speak or spoke. Let's delete those edge loops. They're not doing us any favors. So we're going to make it look something like that. Let's go ahead and solve this out now. And then I'm just gonna come in here and I'm gonna go ahead and ex like Q mesh or extrude that. I'm gonna push that in a little bit. So something like that. So then when I hit dynamic, you see like if I back up, you see how that's looking like a hole, but it's not actually all the way through. Those are little tricks you can use in making miniatures or making anything for 3D printing because it's going to, that's going to dynamesh well and it's going to be welded. Now, if you make cuts like this, the thing to remember is make them big enough so that when you do print it, it actually reads the way it should, but that's exactly how I'd approach it. Pretty simple, pretty fun. All right, everybody, that's going to cover it today. We did go over a little bit, but hopefully you guys enjoyed the How It's Made series. Um, we really like doing them over here, so if this is more of what you would like to see, definitely let us know. We're going to go ahead and release this this STL in the newsletter and we're in the VOD of this video. I'm going to we're going to make sure that it is uh, available for you guys. Um, I'm going to have to go test print it as well, but in this case, I think it will print fairly well the way it is. But we'll get it test printed. I think it'll be fun. So. Thank you guys again for all your questions. All that stuff has been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's all the for Starcraft, man. Just bullying it. Just do it. Yeah, perfect. And I have a lot more ideas as well. So, so we'll, we'll do some really fun stuff. We cover all sorts of great, great topics here. Hard surface stuff. This was pretty cool. Some organic stuff. Um, I know we've gotten questions about blocking out characters. That's always fun. But you guys have been super amazing to hang out with, including that random bot <laughs> that I blocked like 50 times. It's fascinating. Anyway, all right. That's going to be it. Um, I stream every Wednesday at this time from noon to 2 uh, Los Angeles time or Pacific Daylight time. or um, So it's always going to be Wednesday from 12 to 2. Um, we might go over a little bit some days, but... Um, when I do the How It's Made series, it's going to be in this time slot as well. So this time slot will always be this time slot. So 
That being said, thank you guys again. That's going to wrap it up for the day. Also, too, don't forget, we do more Ask Brush videos on YouTube, so check that out. And again, you all have a fantastic day, and we'll get this model to you quick, fast, and in a hurry, as well with that wood texture brush we built. That'll be fun. All right. I'll catch you guys later. Bye.